believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things physical and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten, begotten of the Father before all worlds, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us on the conscious Pilate, and suffered and was buried, and on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with the glory to judge the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who is saved by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. I'm glad to, to see you, uh, you guys here, and um, as you know, as uh, we're going through, please feel free to interrupt with questions, comments, concerns, anything like that, because um, we, while there is an agenda, there isn't a necessary time frame. So um, if it takes us two times to go through the historical background, that's not a big deal. The point is for us to know and understand the creed and everything that, that's going on with it, that's more important than getting through materials. So it's not like, unfortunately, that Arthur has to do at uh, his classes at the university that you have to do certain things at particular times. We just don't have to do that. So please feel free to interrupt. There's no big deal. It feels a little formal because Michelle is, is uh, recording. And those of you that don't know, um, Thursdays at 8 o'clock on AOC, we have a normal program that runs, and these will be on there over the next few weeks as Michelle edits them and uh, things like that. Michelle was actually nominated for an award for her with our uh, church's materials. She did win this time, but uh, perhaps with the new camera and all of that sort of stuff, uh, uh, we'll be able to, to do a little bit better. Uh, but I'm really excited about talking about the creed, and this I'm thankful for a conversation I had with Arthur a couple months ago, just a month ago now, um, where we talked about doing something like the creed, because, and as I've been going through it the last couple of weeks in preparation for today and for the, the weeks moving ahead, I really think there's going to be a lot of conversation, uh, because each of the words of the creed really unlocks a whole box of things. Uh, this morning, uh, you know, jumping ahead a bit, there's the word uh, creator of all things visible and invisible. Well, looking at the invisible creation, we get to talk about the angels and who the angels are and what happened with the fall. And uh, we can even talk about the uh, creation of evil and is that from God? And so there's going to be lots of great discussion to, as we move forward with the creed. Uh, because the creed is this statement that is um, exceptionally important. And Lily, if you want to hit the button there. Um, just have the creed up here itself. The creed is the summary, the best summary that there is of the Christian faith. And this might sound crazy, but the creed predates what we have as the, the, the Bible. Now, the books of the Bible were written earlier than the creed, but it wasn't until the Council of, of Carthage in 397 that what we know as the Bible was set as the Bible. Until that time, this book was more fluid and what books are in, what books are out, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, later on today. Uh, but it was because of this statement, it was because of the Nicene Creed, that even the books were, were finally solidified and chosen because these were the books that best set forth these words and helped us to understand these words. And so they, the scriptures need to be interpreted in light of these words. And if you're interpreting the scripture and it means something besides what the creed is saying, then you're not reading the scripture correctly, is what we can say. So the, the books in the Bible were chosen on the basis of whether they conform to the creed or not. Right. Whether so they that's were why the, some of the ones that weren't chosen weren't chosen. <laughs> right. And they didn't, and you know, the, because the creed sets the boundaries of the Christian faith, um, 
but there's almost still a lot of wiggle room. You know, Mary is mentioned in here, but only as being incarnate of the Holy Spirit, so that when you talk about the Annunciation and things like that, but then the other traditions about Mary are important in the church, but not necessarily things that we have to have in Scripture because of, of their, um, their kind of the extra my mystery that goes along with it. But these are for sure 100%. We cannot compromise anything in this creed at all. And we'll, we'll talk about that for sure as we move forward. Um, so 397 was when those books were solidified. And actually one of the first lists of the books um, was Athanasius, who we'll talk about today as a champion of the First Ecumenical Council. He was one of the first ones to set these are the 27 books that I think should be used, and that's really what happened later on. Those were the ones that were the 27 books in the New Testament. These are the ones that are the best ones to use. So we'll, we'll talk about that uh, moving forward. Joseph, there's a, a sheet here if you want. And there is room up here to sit down if you'd like to. Or just if you're free. Michelle, will, Michelle can edit. <laughs> All right, so I agree. So, for starters, we're going to look at some historical background. If you want to go ahead and hit that. Um, we have Christ, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension into heaven, and then what happens after that? What happens after the ascension? Christ tells the disciples to do what? Um, wait, for the Holy Spirit. wait for the descent of the Holy Spirit, which finally comes on the day of Pentecost, and then what do the disciples do? They go out and preach. They go out, and they go everywhere. And the tradition of the church is, you know, Thomas goes to India, uh, Mark goes to Egypt, uh, Andrew goes into Turkey and, and around in, in that area, so they, they all spread out and go to all these different places in their, their ministry, and they're establishing churches. And we know from the, the letters, especially of, of Ignatius of Antioch, who was a late first century um, a martyr of the church, we know that already by the first century there are bishops, we know that there are priests, we know that there are deacons, and they're establishing this um, structure in the church, in the early church, um, largely because of a first liturgical order, but second, and perhaps more importantly, is the, so that they can make sure and ensure the truth is being taught. In the Divine Liturgy, uh, in, towards the end of the liturgy, there's the prayer, you might recall, among the first, be mindful, O Lord, of our Father and Metropolitan Joseph, our Bishop Antoon, whom thou hast granted uh, to this holy church in peace. Uh, Uh, the phrase I'm looking for is rightly dividing the word of truth. The bishop's responsibility is to make sure that the faith of the apostles is being presented. And so when the apostles establish churches, they leave bishops there to be the ones who are, they've taught them, they have mentored them, they have guided them. It's like, uh, you know, just like in the university, you, you don't just let anybody teach. You have to have those letters in front or behind your name, right? Dr. Arthur White. You have to have that in order to be there. So the same thing with uh, the bishops of, of the early church. They had to be experienced in the faith. They had to know and understand the truth and be able to present it so that the faith wouldn't change. Because, as you all know, you've been Christians for a little while in your life. The faith is really easy to understand, right? You understand everything about it, correct? <laughs> exactly. Sure. Exactly. And we have the internet, and we have the, the entirety of the scripture, and we have all these wonderful books to read, and yet we still struggle with it. So imagine what they were like in the first century, and so they had to make sure that the, the faith was being presented. And so, of course, things didn't always go that, that greatly, so they sent letters around. And so that's where we start to even have these letters so that they can offer correction for some false teachings that were happening, both morally and doctrinally. And so these letters start going around. Um, Lily, do you want to read that first um, quote on the page there? Now when this epistle is read among you, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans. 
Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Okay, so that's Paul telling the Colossians, here's this letter, you read it, pass it on to this other church, so that they can read it, and you take theirs and read that one. Okay, this, this verse is important for that reason, to show that they're spreading these, these epistles around to each other, so that they're all reading these words from the apostles, so that they can have the same faith. But it also helps us even to see that there was perhaps the debate and the confusion about books. Is there an epistle to the Laodiceans in the New Testament? No, do we know anything about it? There is not. Some scholars, they, they guess and they try to, they, some of them will say that it's actually the book of Philippians or something like that. Um, but really nobody knows. Uh -huh. Nobody knows. And so we may have lost one of Paul's letters. Exactly. But that's to say, then, that perhaps they, they knew about that letter. It was either lost, or it wasn't as um, succinct as they wanted it to be, and so they said, well, we, we just won't use this one. So all of the books that are there in the New Testament are not necessarily all of the letters that Paul wrote, or Peter wrote, or uh, James wrote, or John wrote, but just the ones that the church said, these are the ones that we really need to be sure to read. There might have been more specific Laodicean problems that were in that letter, uh, kind of like the Corinthians, uh, that have specific Corinthian problems uh, from Corinth. So, Lily, you look like you had a question there? Who are, the, uh, who are they? They're the people from the city of Laodicea. Wow, well, I figured that. <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of the cities in... Um, I think if you know, we were talking about geography earlier, I think Laodicea is, um, it's in Asia Minor, I, I believe. I think that's where it is. But in, I was just sitting area. here being embarrassed because I'm not sure. Exactly. But I think that's where it is. I'll Google it later. I, I think it's in Asia Minor, not <laughs> and then you can tell us. <laughs> close okay. to the Mediterranean um, because Paul, you know, makes his journey through that whole area, through Greece, Asia Minor, and, and in those areas. So it's, it's in that area. Where he's going. Yeah, be like Western Turkey. Today. Western Turkey, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Not far even from where Istanbul and Constantinople is. Thank you, John. Was there, uh, there also two, um, like we have First Corinthians and Second Corinthians? I'm trying to, or was there an implication? I'm trying to remember. I think there's an implication in Second Corinthians too, yep. or possibly a third letter, or maybe one that came between the two, yes. or something like that. Yes, and in fact, some scholars, and again, scholars a lot of times are guessing, mm -hmm. but some scholars think that Second Corinthians is actually made up of four different letters that were spliced together in into one, so that it would make be one complete whole. Uh, so there are some scholars that that would say that and that would answer the implication that there was letters in between. They're, they're there. We're not missing anything. Uh, but we're, we're really not sure. We're really not sure. Uh, probably just a fraction of what he, what he actually in his you know, writing official was a lot bigger than that. And Paul, as we found in our discussions with Romans, we've been doing Romans at the CC's on South College the last couple of weeks, and uh, we've made it through a chapter and a, and a half. <laughs> a chapter and a quarter. Um, and it's been wonderful discussion, but it can be confusing. So Arthur, why don't you read that next quote there from uh, the second epistle of Peter. Okay. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Okay, this is, this is an interesting passage because Peter calls the letters of Paul scripture. He equates them with Scripture, and that's really the first place that we have that, where we have these letters that probably has been officially part of what is thought of as Scripture, because Peter's understanding of Scripture is the Old Testament. But he's equating Paul's writings with that, but he's saying some of that stuff in there is hard to understand. 
and untaught and unstable people twist them around to their destruction. And you can think about any number of places where you pick out passages from Paul and you can make the scriptures mean almost anything. I, I've told you all this before, but it's worth reminding that Irenaeus, uh, in his writing against the heresies, uh, talks about how scripture is a mosaic. And mosaic are little tiles, right? And when they're put together properly, the mosaic reveals the picture of a king. But Irenaeus says that you can take those same mosaic tiles and make it be the picture of a fox. <laughs> and so that's how you can twist it. Uh, untaught and unstable people can twist the scriptures to mean whatever they, they want it to mean, or to mean something completely different. So he's telling them to be careful, to be careful on how they interpret the scripture. And then this last quote that's on here, and Mary, if you want to, to read that one, it's from St. Paul's um, first epistle to Timothy. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified by the Spirit, seen by the angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory. Okay, the really very, very important phrase of that uh, reading is where St. Paul calls, it's right there in the middle, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And so it's the church that is the bearer of the truth. The church that is the, the, the um, instrument of God in this world to ensure that truth and the proper teachings are being put forward. And so it's not that, it's not only that we can sit and read the scriptures, but because we are untaught and unstable people, counting myself in that, with the potential to misinterpret and misunderstand the scriptures, and I need the church to be able to, to hold me there. And so as we'll see, the creed becomes that becomes the way that that is stabilized. That you start reading the scripture, and when you're interpreting it, and it means something different than what you're reading in the creed, you are interpreting it wrong. Because the church, as we'll see through the ecumenical councils, established this as the most important statement of faith, as 100% for sure true, and if you're reading and understanding something contrary to that, then you are mistaken in how you're understanding it. And it's that easy. So, you know, it's a good thing. You know, we have these in the pews there, right? You can even uh, take one home, perhaps, put it next to your Bible, and while you're reading through, if you have a question, and you think, well, this sounds like it's saying that Jesus isn't fully God. Then you look in here and say, oh, be light of light, very God of very God. No problem. I must be wrong about that. And that's that's exactly what happens throughout the course of history, thanks to uh, the creed. So it's a good thing for you to know, for you to have in your heart, for you to have in your mind. And that's why if you follow the, the prayer book that the Orthodox Church gives us, we don't just say the creed in liturgy, we say the creed every day, twice a day. Morning prayers and evening prayers, and it has the little thing in the red prayer book that says, now recite the creed. And it's there so that we have it. We know it. We are, are constantly remembering what we actually believe. So that's what's happening with these letters that are going around. And we need the church. We need the church. Okay, if you want to hit the next slide. And so arises in that time, we have great teachers like Ignatius of Antioch, who uh, wrote seven letters as he was journeying from Antioch to Rome to be uh, killed um, in the, the, the Colosseum. And really, I would encourage all of you to read those uh, works. They're not very long. They're really wonderful. Uh, Irenaeus of Lyon that we've talked about in the past, um, he was a, a second century, uh, late second, early third century writer. And he wrote um, uh, five books against heresies. And in that, he goes through all these various heresies that are happening during uh, his time, and we'll talk about a couple of them here in a few minutes, and then he lays out the Christian faith. And so he uses, uh, he, he uses the scriptures uh, that, that he had, and he talks about the, the faith of the church. 
Justin Martyr does the same thing. He writes his apologies in the, the second century, and um, he talks about the worship of the church. So we have these early teachers. And I included Origen here, and I was talking to Marion about this uh, before, the, uh, before we started. This is a, I'm going to use air quotes, icon of Origen teaching the saints. Origen is a very controversial figure in the church. He was a, a uh, third century uh, teacher, and he said some things that were uh, condemned that I want to say he wasn't ever condemned. Some of his writings were condemned. He taught about reincarnation. He taught about that it was dogma that everyone would eventually be saved. And he taught other things like the perfect shape was a sphere, so when we enter the kingdom of God, we'll all be spherical. <laughs> Plato said that. Uh, right, exactly. Yeah, and, and, and many Greeks did. And Origen, when he got too philosophical, is where he started to have problems. Um, when he stuck to the scripture, and in fact, if you read Origen's commentaries on the scripture, they are excellent. He, he really is a great... Uh, um, interpreter of scripture, and in fact, I was telling Marion beforehand that Gregory the theologian uh, compiled a work, uh, the Philokalia, uh, which we know today as a compilation of, of um, works of the fathers on prayer. The first Philokalia was actually the writings of Origen uh, that he compiled and said, these are the good ones to read. And it wasn't until 300 years after Origen died that some of his writings were condemned. And we only even know about them, those particular writings, from people who wrote against him because they destroyed those. But what they have, what have been kept alive are his commentaries on the scriptures and, and things like that. Uh, and I'm reluctant to call him a, a heretic because, I was, I was telling Marion, that a heretic is someone who is confronted with their error and refuses to repent. Origen was never confronted with his error because this was at a time when they weren't having the ecumenical councils and they didn't have the Nicene Creed and so he was just teaching. And like Paul, he was very verbose and just philosophized a lot. A lot. Yes. So the, I put him there though also to say that even in the midst of the early church, there were some teachers that weren't getting it completely right weren't getting it completely right. And so it was very it was very important for them to be able to come to a place where they could have the creed. Besides the, the writings of the um, apostles that we know as the New Testament today, uh, there's also things like the Didache, which are, is known as the Teaching of the Apostles, a very, very early document. Uh, the Shepherd of Hermes, which was one of the things that was, uh, it's kind of ap apocalyptic in nature. And there were some of the fathers of the church that even wanted to have that as one of the books of the, of the New Testament, but it was, ended up not being included. Uh, the Epistle to Diognetus is really a, an early apology um, that uh, was in the church. And these are first, second century documents that are just like the letters of Paul and the letters of Peter are being floated around the church. So there are other things that are going up around, and there are other teachers that are there, and they're not just not quite potentially not quite getting it right. Um, I've wondered this all my life practically, so I'm going to take the chance to ask, why is Justin Martyr called that when nobody else who was a martyr is? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, he is uh, sometimes called Justin the Philosopher, and that, that might be a better, um, better way to, to say that, but I, I'm not sure why his is just Justin Martyr. But that's the way he's been known for Alan years. But nobody else has known that way. Nope. Yeah. Most everybody else would be the other way around, the martyr just the yeah. uh, higher martyr so and so or something like that. But it's just just a Okay, so it's just the way I said except that. I, exactly. Sorry. I wish I had a better answer. Yeah. Okay. Lily, if you'll hit the in the early church, with these various books that are going around, and with the, um, the teachings that are going on, there were things that weren't correct, that were being taught. And so we're talking from the very beginning, there's some things that are going on. One of the biggest categories, and I call it a category, because Gnosticism, um, one of the papers I had to write in seminary, uh, the, the professor told us to answer the question, just what is Gnosticism? 
really, there's a million answers to that question because, but not. A bong in Yeah. Uh -huh. 